Uh oh. Okay, we'll start with this. This weekend, two-division WBA Super Bantamweight champion Erica Cruz will be defending her title south of the border against her mandatory challenger of Argentina, Nazarena Romero, a fight that we've talked about several times in passing. What are the implications? What happens if Erica wins? What happens if Nazarena wins? What does this mean for the division? Because they're both so aggressive and so prolific within a round, they throw so many punches, they'll be subject to each other's power. But Nazarena, in spite of being less experienced than Erica, she seems to have more of it. So the possibility of her winning, it is palpable. It's there. Erica Cruz is durable and exciting and experienced, but she's no defensive wizard. Defense ain't her speciality. They're both pressure fighters mid-range to inside volume punchers. So there are going to be exchanges. And in the exchange, the fighter with the bigger guns does more damage. Erica is durable. She is durable. She went the distance with Amanda Serrano up there at 126, but now she's down there at 122. So perhaps she was solid enough at 126 to take hard shots, get into an all out war with one of the hardest punchers in the sport but that was at 126. At 122 and making that weight, maybe it takes enough out of her that she don't take a punch so good, maybe. At 122, if you're going to entertain a scenario where Nazarena hurts her and Nazarena takes her out. Now, if you're gonna entertain a scenario where Nazarena loses, maybe she loses because Eric is durable, more durable than anybody Nazarena has fought so far, and she's more aggressive than anybody Nazarena has fought so far. That Nazarena might have some moments at the start, but down the stretch, Erica wears her out because Erica is a very busy fighter, very busy puncher, very unorthodox and awkward. Maybe Erica can push Nazarena in a way that Nazarena has never been pushed before, and that'll be enough to win the fight. Neither would surprise me, neither scenario. So what are the implications in either scenario if Erica wins win, and win, she remains win, this win. division's WBA champion, there will be a credible enough argument for her to be ranked on the ring IQ pound for pound list on the premise that she would have a stronger resume, stronger career accomplishments than Sandy Ryan, who's currently ranked at number 10 and in the most danger of being bumped off, bumped off by a more accomplished fighter. Remember how Sandy got there. Sandy got there because she fought Terry Harper and she stopped her. Up until that point, Terry was ranked on the Ring IQ pound for pound list per the rules that govern it. In defeating a pound for pound fighter, you may become one yourself. But your body of work up until that point, it still matters. And it's still being measured against the body of work from other fighters. In this situation, Sandy's body of work so far is being measured against Erica, that while Sandy did beat a pound for pound fighter in Terry Harper to gain a rank, she doesn't have a more solid resume than Erica Cruz. How so? Erica has already taken more belts from more champions at more weights than Sandy Ryan. When Sandy fought Terry, she fought her as a defending champion. She didn't actually win a belt from Terry, she was just defending her own. Whereas Erica beat reigning champion Jelena Marjanovic for the WBA at 126, then she moved down in weight and beat Meyerlene Rivas for her WBA title at 122. She's taken two belts from two reigning champions 
at two weights. Sandy's only been a champion in one. Erica's got her beat two championship scalps to none. Because I reiterate, Terry wasn't a champion when she fought Sandy. She was a challenger. So if Erica wins, and wins in good fashion, points for style, she's gonna bump Sandy Ryan out of that number 10 spot and emerge somewhere else on the list based on what she's done so far and racking up a successful title defense. Another one. She'll look to unify afterwards with one of the other champions at the weight, unified champion Ellie Scottney or Yemi Mercado. She's made that clear. That's what her intentions are if she wins. But if she loses, and Nazarena Romero beats her, she knocks her out, whatever. Nazarena wins the belt from Erica, that will turn this division upside down and make becoming an undisputed champion within it that much harder. Make it harder for Ellie Scottney, make it harder for Yemi Mercado, the two remaining champions at this weight. It's hard to imagine that Nazarena Romero could leave Mexico with a decision and the WBA title. Thus, if you're entertaining a scenario where she wins, you must be entertaining a scenario where she knocks out Erica or just makes it so lopsided they don't have a choice but to give her a decision. It's what Erica has. She has experience and home field advantage on her side. And she is the house fighter, the matchroom fighter. That may get her consideration with the judges, though the thing about Nazarena is she doesn't need judges. She can take it out of their hands. If you stand and trade with her on the inside, you're gonna be subject to her power. If you try to run, she'll walk you down. Not that Erica Cruz is some stick and move outside fighter because she isn't. But if she tries to be, that will only make Nazarena seem the busier fighter of the two, the busier fighter in the round. If Erica wins this fight, she'll look to unify. And if Nazarena wins this fight, she'll look to unify too. But if we're entertaining a scenario when Nazarena knocks out Erica Cruz, I'd say that makes becoming an undisputed champion at this weight a lot more dangerous for the other two champions. More than before. Elsewhere in the world of boxing, I'm sure most of you have heard by now per a tweet from Michael Benson, when Ryan Garcia tested positive for Osterin, one of his drug tests also showed a nendrolone metabolite, but required further analysis, which has not confirmed as positive. Garcia, therefore, is just fighting positives for Osterin. B sample is to be opened on May 22nd. Ryan Garcia took to his social media, seemingly jubilant, saying, so y'all realize I didn't fail the tests now, right? No substance other than this imaginary ostrich substance, a level so low it wouldn't have any effect. They tried, but no lie stands. Praise God. Why is he saying he didn't fail any tests? Is he deliberately misrepresenting the situation? Veteran boxing scribe Dan Raphael responded by saying, A. Cleared of 19 norindrosterone for more detailed testing. B. There's nothing imaginary about the ped osterin. Faces hearing likely punishment for two failed tests. C. Osterin amount doesn't matter. Some things you can have up to a threshold. Osterin is not allowed at any level. It's what I told you in my previous video. Osterin is a qualifiable substance, not a quantifiable substance, because there is no acceptable threshold for Osterin. It's not like clenbuterol. That's quantifiable. It means that it matters how much clenbuterol is found in a fighter's body. Once it is quantified, if it is at or below the acceptable threshold, fighters in the clear, but Osterin is not a quantifiable substance. It's a qualifiable substance, so it doesn't matter how much of it they found in your system, it's not supposed to be there. Twice saying that they only found a low level of Osterin in a system is either a misrepresentation of what's going on or a misunderstanding. You don't understand. Ryan Garcia's attorney, Darren Chavez, told ESPN on Tuesday that the B sample will be opened and analyzed on May 22nd. Chavez will witness the examination. Osterin is the substance that was present in his A sample. Chavez said yesterday's VADA report showed 19 norindrosterone wasn't present in Garcia's system. That's the other pet. But Osterin still was. Chavez claimed this is proof we are dealing only with a known supplement contaminant in the billionth of a gram range that provided Ryan Garcia with no performance enhancing benefit whatsoever on fight night. We now wait for B-sample testing on the presence of 
low-level Osterin on May 22nd. Another misrepresentation. There are some substances that are not banned outside of competition. That 24-hour window before a fight takes place. Like clomiphene. Osterin is not like clomiphene. In competition, out of competition, it's a banned substance. It's a banned substance at all times. On the water banned list, on the vada banned list. It's banned at all times. So when you say that this very low amount of Osterin had no bearing on Ryan Garcia's performance the night of the fight, that's besides the point because it's not supposed to be there. And just as easily as it could indicate cross-contamination, it could also indicate microdosing. Could be either one. It's not a smoking gun that the Osterin found itself in Ryan's system as a result of cross-contamination. That could easily be a guy who's microdosing. He thought he flushed all of it out of his system, but he miscalculated. So a very small amount of it was still in his system the day before and the day of the fight. But if you're gonna go the anecdotal route and you think this is anecdotal evidence of cross-contamination, it could just as easily be anecdotal evidence of microdosing. There are a lot of people that want Ryan Garcia to be innocent. They want him to beat this. Javante Davis is one among them saying, so Ryan beat Buddy's ass fair and square. What does the French bulldog face lady, Clarissa, Clarissa Shields, have to say about this? And she blocked me. I should have blocked her ass for the way she looks. She scares me. Why is he beefing with her? They've been going back and forth with each other over this Devin Haney, Ryan Garcia ped thing since the whole thing started. They've been arguing on social media. I just couldn't be bothered to make a video about it. What you need to know is that Gervonta Davis seems to want Ryan Garcia to be clear. He wants him to be innocent. But we're not there yet. Why not? Because he still has to account for the osterin they found in his system. However big or however small, he has to account for it. It's a qualifiable substance, not a quantifiable substance. So just because they found a small amount doesn't mean you're in the clear. You still have to explain yourself and try to account for where it came from. One minute they're saying that Conti and the Haney's put it there. The next minute they're saying that it may have come from cross-contamination, contaminated supplements. Well, which one is it? Did somebody deliberately contaminate your test samples or did you inadvertently take contaminated supplements? If you want to go that route, you have to prove what supplement you took was contaminated. You have to account for anything and everything you were taking at the time to prove that's where it came from and exonerate yourself of wrongdoing or intentional wrongdoing because the athlete is still liable for whatever they take. What? what? Strict what? liability. If you're on some kind of supplement regimen or routine, you can actually have those supplements sent out to a lab to be tested to ensure that they're not contaminated with anything. I remember reading that. In order to avoid a situation like this one. Now I think it's gonna cost you some money to do that, but Ryan Garcia's got money, the money from the Davis fight, the money that he just made with Devin. To cover all the bases. And that's assuming that Ryan is innocent. I still think that he's guilty. The simplest explanation is usually the right one, that Ryan is just another dirty fighter among many dirty fighters that get caught. Well, if you're gonna be so matter-of-fact about it, why are so many people hung up on Ryan being innocent? Asserting his innocence? Because they want his victory over Devin to be a legitimate victory without an asterisk, without performance-enhancing drugs staining it. They want to be able to say that Ryan beat him fair and square. I'm Travis Tiger from USADA. We've issued an athlete advisory. It's actually a dietary supplement warning about a group of drugs that we're finding in a lot of dietary supplements known as SARMs. They're prohibited in sport and include names like Osterine, and include names like Osterine, and include names like Osterine. We think it's being intentionally put in dietary supplements, maybe through contamination as well. <laughs> we think it's being intentionally put in dietary supplements, maybe through contamination as well. Sometimes it's on the label, sometimes it's not on the label. Sometimes it's not on the label. You may be thinking to yourself that this adequately explains Ryan Garcia's situation, but he hasn't actually proved 
that the osterin found in his system came from a supplement that he was taking at the time. That's what he has to establish. That's what he has to prove because he's not all clear. Why would the manufacturer of a supplement deliberately put osterin in it but fail to put that on the label? Not saying that that's the case with Ryan, but just playing devil's advocate and addressing that. A manufacturer may use an ingredient and something they're selling, a supplement or something else, to enhance its effectiveness. Knowing that said ingredient is perhaps prohibited, prohibited by the FDA or prohibited for use when it comes to athletes, they might so use that ingredient to enhance the supplement's effectiveness, thereby misrepresenting why the supplement is so effective when used. You're thinking it's effective because of A and B, not realizing it's actually effective because of C. And whatever C is, it's not actually on the label, so you don't know that you're taking it. If you did, you might decide not to take it. If you were aware that Osterin is in a supplement and you're a boxer, then you might know, well, I can't take this. This is banned. Trying to understand why a supplement company, a manufacturer, would use an ingredient they deliberately fail to list on their product, that's at least one reason I can think of. They want to have the best brand of whatever on the market. They want it to be effective, so much so they might bend the rules to do it. To achieve what? Sales. If the product proves effective to the consumer, they're going to tell their friends about it, their neighbors. I started taking this stuff and the weight just came right off. And before you know it, everybody's buying it. The supplier gets to make all of that money and the customers are none the wiser. They don't really know why it works. The problem with a strategy like this one is that sooner or later, it's going to come out that the active ingredient or one of the ingredients that's in these supplements, the reason that it's so effective is because you're using something you're not supposed to use something the customers aren't aware of so you can imagine how that might play out in court that's the current situation when it comes to dillian white the last time that guy pissed hot was because they found a banned substance in his system and it took him a long while to establish that the substance came from some supplements he was taking once he was able to establish that he was all clear to fight and now he's suing that company. We talked about that here on the channel. Now that's what Ryan has to do. Ryan has to retrace his steps, go back to whatever he was taking at the time to establish that that's where the osterin came from. You believe him? Not really. A guy who says that he was drinking and smoking in the buildup of this fight nonstop. A guy who admits that he deliberately blew the weight because he didn't want to be weak. I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility that a guy like that might look for a competitive edge by doping. But if that's not the situation, it's up to Ryan to prove it. Because if nothing else, they did find Osterin in your system two times. You have to account for it. You keep telling people that it's a very low level that they found, but it could be a low level because you were microdosing. Maybe you flushed out your system. You thought you got it all out and you miscalculated. It could be any number of things, but these are things that Ryan has to explain. You're not going to get the benefit of the doubt from me just because. You had a guy that says you were lying the whole time about being mentally ill and being molested. So how do I know that you're not lying right now?